I had about a year of a buffer or a safety net to make this work that I figured if I lived frugally on the road, I could live for a lot cheaper than in my home country. And I would be able to keep myself afloat while I built up this business. And so, yeah, I gave myself a year to make it work. And here we are. It's now sustainable to keep up this lifestyle. You hear this so many times, transferring like your real job experience is like the easiest way to get into freelancing. And it really is. And I was in denial because at first I was like, well, I don't know if this is actually what I want to do ultimately, but it is the easiest barrier of entry. Sometimes I record an interview and I'm just sitting on it and I can't wait to get it out to you. And today's episode is one of those. That was Janessa Klatt and Caitlin Sunderland, and they are part of the core team here at the Zero to Travel podcast. They are making this show happen week in and week out. So I was excited to bring them on for a few reasons. First of all, as you heard in those clips, they made the transition to travel in two different ways. And I think these two ways really encompass a lot of different lessons for people listening. If you are somebody who is maybe a little bit afraid of being stuck in a career or a job you're in right now, or if you just want to find a way to travel on your terms, the best way to do that, I should say one of the best ways is to work for yourself. But that can be a bit hard, a bit intimidating. And Janessa and Caitlin have found a way to do it in their own unique ways. As you heard in that clip, Janessa saved up. She had about a year of a buffer financially to make it work. Caitlin, on the other hand, had some transferable skills that she used to start her business. So they are coming at it from two different angles that covers so much. You're going to hear why a side hustle may be right for you and may not be right for you, how you can start a business with no website and no skills, or how you can take the current skill set you have and transfer them to become a remote work professional. And of course, an opportunity to get to know these two lovely humans who help keep this podcast going. And that's all happening right now in this episode. So buckle up, strap in. Thanks for being here. And welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey, hey, it's Jason here with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience. So much going on today. Finally, welcoming two of the key members to the Zero to Travel podcast team here onto the show, as you'll hear from them. Uh, The first question I ask them is if it's annoying to work with me. So (laughs) maybe you go a little further behind the scenes than, than we should even let you know. No, you're more than welcome to come back behind the scenes here with us today. Of course, uh, an opportunity to get to know some of the people that help make this show happen week in and week out. Janessa is the partnerships manager. Caitlin is my associate producer. And I have the various links here in the show notes. If you're interested in working with them or checking out their businesses or just connecting with them, you can feel free to go into the show notes and find their respective locations online where you can connect with them. As I mentioned, this couldn't have come together any better, this episode. I really didn't know exactly how we were going to bring it together from a um, sort of actionable content standpoint. And when we started throwing around ideas and Caitlin and Janessa shared a little bit about their journeys and their transition to travel and how they made that pivot and how they were coming at it from these two completely unique angles, I realized, wow, this is almost covers any way that somebody listening would be coming at this. If you were somebody who wanted to dive into the digital nomad lifestyle, the remote workspace, and you wanted to do it in a way where you could control where you go, traveling on your terms, not by working for somebody, but by working for yourself as a freelancer, uh, for starters, and they've just given you the, the reality 
behind it all, what it took, how their journeys came together. And of course, you'll be able to pull out their best tips, advice, and perspectives to apply to your situation. So if you're somebody that doesn't think they have any online business skills to offer, or if you think you might and you're not really sure how to do it, how to sell, what it all looks like, what the process is like, uh, there's a lot going on in this interview. Plus, you'll get some destination recommendations, of course, as usual. So please enjoy this conversation with Caitlin and Janessa, and I will catch you on the back end. I'll leave you with a quote plus a few thoughts on the chat. Don't forget, sign up for our newsletter over at zerototravel.com slash newsletter if you have not done so yet. Now here's my conversation with Caitlin and Janessa. Thanks for listening. <laughs> well, we're all laughing because we just spent three people who are in the podcast industry just spent 30 minutes trying to record this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't be more excited to say welcome, Caitlin and Janessa, to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friends. The the core team of the Zero to Travel Ooh. podcast. Welcome. Thank you. That's such a full circle moment hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing wild because I feel like I've dreamed about this my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get carried away, <laughs> ladies. Let's not get carried away. Just so people know your voices, just introduce yourselves really so they know who's talking. So, Caitlin, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, hey, I'm Caitlin and I am Jason's associate producer. We've been working together for about a year now. So, yeah. That's me. We have. Janessa. <laughs> and hello, I'm Janessa. I am the head of partnerships for Zero to Travel. And I've been living nomadically as a podcast manager for over a year and a half now. All right. And of course, you have your businesses, like we talked about uh, at the top of the intro, that associated with podcast management and things like that. And I thought you sent over a bunch of ideas because the whole kind of genesis of the episode, I was like, well, wait a minute, let's... We need to bring people behind the scenes of the Zero to Travel podcast. But also, I realized like you guys have been on these travel journeys as well. We practice what we preach here at the Zero to Travel podcast. And you have a lot of uh, lessons that you've learned. And we said, well, it would be really cool if you brought some of your best lessons, um, which a lot of that involves. Well, I've, I've kind of pulled out three, three main themes from what you sent over. So I'll tease that out. I just want to say at the top, massive gratitude. Thank you. I super appreciate like everything you guys do and you're the beating heart of this podcast. And uh, I mean, it's because of everything you all do on the daily that I'm able to keep the show going and focus on the content and everything. So I just want to like acknowledge that and say, thank you very much. And I'm excited to have you here. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having us, Jason. <laughs> and the first question I had was, am I annoying to work with? <laughs> Not at all, Jason. Not at all. Oh, you tell all the clients that. You're my favorite, Jason. Hopefully none of them are going to listen to this episode. <laughs> Too sweet. No, I'm kidding. I mean, I'm sure I am sometimes, but aren't all clients. Uh, you know, I, you know, what's funny, I think this may be our first ever group call, which is hilarious and probably says a lot about how infrequently I, I try to do like sort of meetings and stuff like that. Before we get into these themes... If you guys could just share a fun fact about yourselves that most people don't know, because I'm, I'm here to learn more about you as well, as long as, as well as sharing these tips that you guys are going to share today. I know I'm putting you on the spot here because you didn't get any of this in advance, but that's what we do. So Oof. who wants to go first? <laughs> I, not me. <laughs> I can go with that one, Caitlin. <laughs> um, my fun fact is obviously I didn't say when I wanted to grow up that I wanted to be a podcast manager or producer because that didn't exist yet. So when I was young, I actually wanted to be a professional athlete. So I actually traveled around a lot of North America when I was a teenager competing in triathlons. So that was one of my first ways that I kind of got exposure to travel when I was young. Wow. I, I didn't know that. That's hardcore. What does a triathlon look like so at that age? Is it, it is swimming, cycling and running. So at the moment, I'm team carry on only. But back in the day, I was hauling a bike all over the country. Wow. Are you still 
pretty active doing those three things? Not necessarily. It's definitely harder when you live on the road. A few years ago, I did get to compete in Switzerland, actually, at a age group triathlon world championships. So that just means that it's the non-elite, non-professional level that anyone can qualify in their home country. So I did that just before I moved away from Canada. And then I happened to move to Europe. And so I was able to just head on down to Switzerland and rent a bike and show up at this, you know, world class event, having not trained a whole lot at that point. But it was a cool way to kind of reconnect with the sport a few years later after I retired. Why are Canadians so friendly? I always wonder that. <laughs> Is there something in the Tim Hortons coffee? You know, I, I grew up in the center of Canada. And then after I graduated university, I moved up to the East Coast, Halifax in Nova Scotia. And then I was shocked at how friendly they were compared to what I had grown up with. So I'd say the <laughs> further east you go in Canada, the more friendly. Nice. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. All right. Caitlin, can you give us a fun fact about yourself? Man, not a good one like that. Um, <laughs> let's see. My no pressure. Fact. Come on. That's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> hmm. All right. Well, my, mine's a fun fact, but it's not travel related, but that's all okay. right. <laughs> so um, I used to work at a living history museum, um, which is when you instead of going to like a regular museum that has like artifacts and things like that. Um, it's like, it was a 17th century museum. So it was a recreated village and the tour guides were not tour guides. They were really, um, I'll call them reenactors to keep it simple, but essentially they were like reenactors. So they wore really funny 17th century clothing. Um, and I got to be in a Jamestown documentary in said funny clothing. Um, I have a wonderful photo of it that I should send you, Jason. Um, but yeah, most people don't know that fun fact about me that I got to be in nice. a Jamestown documentary as like as an extra. So when you went to work, you had to get into character, so I, to speak. Yes, I didn't because I did like I did more of like the communications and social work. But every once in a while, I did have to get up in some kind of garb and and help out. <laughs> Nice. I mean, were there people that were like, I never break character, like, you know, really taking their method acting seriously? <laughs> so they didn't really like, it wasn't like acting per se like that. So no, um, but they did take their roles very seriously. They were very serious uh, historians. So uh, I definitely, uh, they didn't like me so much because I wasn't as up to date on my history facts. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried my best. Well. Thanks. I'm glad that you switched careers into the podcast world. Me personally. too. I'm very thankful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, speaking uh, about career shifts, that's something you've both done and something a lot of people listening are looking to do. Maybe they're in the uh, ramping up for one. Maybe they're in the midst of, of one, making a transition to travel, adding more travel into their life, trying to figure it out, which is always kind of a difficult thing. You know, I asked you to bring some of your best advice and some practical tips based, based on your expertise, based on your experience, you sent me over some, some golden nuggets, I'll say, and three themes emerged to me. And, and the first theme was really just the, the idea of building your life, a life of work and travel, even when you feel like you have no skills, like you're not sure how to get started, all, all of those things that kind of it, it, like when you're looking at starting, it looks like a giant mountain in front of you. And you're like, how am I going to do all this? And you've both been able to do it. So yeah, I mean, if, if I want to bounce it back to Janessa here, and maybe you could share a bit of some of your key learnings from, you know, going from where you did and, and then maybe along the way, kind of sharing your journey and how you kind of transition to where you're at today. Sure. So when Caitlin and I were talking about this, we realized we kind of came at it from different angles. She had some existing skills that she was able to use and grow those skills and eventually morph into what we're doing today. Whereas I was the one that felt like I had zero online skills, zero digital skills. I like to joke that I never had a job that involved a computer before I became, as some people would say, a digital nomad. So like I said, the professional athlete dreams didn't pan out. So the next best option was my degree was in kinesiology or sports science. 
So when people ask if I studied something related to podcast or media or marketing, absolutely not. I was training athletes in a gym, so it couldn't be further from what I'm doing now. So I did do that for a little while after I graduated university and then realized that I wanted to travel more. I was really just afraid of becoming stuck in a career like that where the work itself I enjoyed, but everything else around it, it was very random hours, low pay. I wasn't able to travel like I wanted to. So I was really just afraid of becoming stuck in that. And so that was the first time that I kind of did something unconventional and said I was going to go take an adult gap year. And I didn't have the money to just go backpacking indefinitely like some people do. I saved up as much as I could, but I knew I would have to get an in-person job pretty quick. So as Canadians, we're actually very lucky. We get a lot of access to working holiday visas. I think you've had some people on the show talk about those. Most countries have some options, but I decided to move to Germany. So I remember telling my employer that I was leaving and they were shocked that I didn't have another job lined up, that I wasn't going to be working in the field of sports science and training athletes. So that was my first adventure into moving abroad, living abroad, having a home base in Europe that allowed me to travel pretty much every month in Europe, I was seeing a different place. So I did get an in-person job in Berlin. I was working at a bar at the time. And that kind of really sparked even more this desire to travel. I thought that it would be a one-year situation and then I would go back to a conventional life in Canada and get a new job after that. But I've just celebrated over five years of living abroad now, and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. (laughs) One of the things that you mentioned was the idea of being more afraid of being stuck in the job than of making the leap to move abroad and travel. And I think that I just wanted to highlight that as a mindset shift for some people listening at that point, like the tipping point of fear, I guess you would say, if there's a point where you're, if you're looking at your job and and you're kind of afraid because you don't know what's on the other side and the unknown and travel and, and living that life. But if you kind of flip it, like you were saying, and just realize you you may be more afraid of being stuck in a job than actually going out and traveling. It can just kind of flip fear on its head, I feel. Absolutely. At that point, I was in the running for a much better job that kind of would have been those golden handcuffs where it would have made it much harder to leave. So even though I wasn't making much money at the time, you know, I sold everything and just decided to start on this adventure, which ended up leading to two years of living in Germany including um, once the pandemic started, I did decide to stay. I had just renewed my visa for a second year. So I was very fortunate that I was able to kind of stay at the home base I had established there and kind of wait it out. And I had a few more pivots after that, even before I got to the podcast thing. It was a bit of a winding road for me. Again, it wasn't like I just had these skills and was able to go from an in-person job to online. So the next part of The next chapter of that story was I decided I was going to get a job on a yacht because those those jobs kept going during COVID and it would allow me to stay in Europe, stay traveling in what was kind of a safe way at the time, kind of have a bubble of people to live and work with and just another adventure. So again, I had no skills of working on a boat. I did not come from the marine industry. I come from the prairies of Canada, as far from the ocean as possible. And so that was another pivot that just kind of taught me that if I want to learn these skills, how, however random they are, that I'm able to figure it out, do a little bit of training and kind of get my foot in the door however I can and then just learn from people as I go. So I ended up working as a deckhand on two different private yachts over the next year and a half or so until... I suddenly then made the leap into podcast management or not suddenly it was it was a slow build up but I kind of realized again that as much as it was an exciting adventure I wanted to be able to travel on my own terms again and not where someone told me that the boat was going so in that sense I you know had a home base on the boat but I lived wherever the owners wanted the boat to be so at the time I was listening to a ton of podcasts that gave me a lot of inspiration about what other career options were out there, other ways that people were making it work to work and travel. Of course, zero to travel was a huge part of that. So as I was, you know, washing salt off the boat for the millionth time that day, I would have one earbud in my ear and I was listening to stories of other people who had made this leap. So even though I'd made already a couple leaps, um, I kind of knew that it was time for another one. 
Thanks for the kind words. It warms my heart to think you were listening to this while you were wiping the salt off the boat for the umpteenth time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Caitlin, I'm I'm coming to you in a second. I just a few things I wanted to pull out of there because, well, first of all, is no skills the new skills? I mean, that's no. It's encouraging though, and and also thinking about you sharing your story and now, you know, if you've heard other people here and other podcasts and everything that inspired you, and now you're paying that forward by sharing yours. And I think that's. I just want to acknowledge that and say thank you to both of you for for being here to do that. You know, the working holiday visa thing, I know that can be a great option for people. But a lot of those, there's there can be a limit on those, like a 30, 30 years old is is generally the limit on on some of those. I'm just like speaking generally. But the alternative to that, like you said, is in-person jobs. And I think those are kind of harder to see when we're used to implying online and doing different things like that showing up somewhere and and getting a job in person like bartending or working at a hostel or something like that those are viable options for a lot of people and then the gap year thing was the other thing i just wanted to pull out and the fact that you know it might be a little bit overwhelming or unpredictable or maybe it's not something you even want to live a, like in a multi-year nomadic existence but starting off with a small chunk is a great way to kind of kickstart things and obviously you're still going which means you enjoy it so Amazing. We'll have to unpack some of the yacht stories in, in a future episode, I think. Absolutely. But <laughs> I'm sure you got a few. Caitlin, you guys mentioned you discussed this and you're coming at it from another angle. And what's what was your take on how you have been able to build this life of work and travel with, with your particular journey? Yeah. So mine also was like very not linear, but um, I had a, a communications degree which side note, I chose literally because there was no math involved in it. Um, so, so I chose my <laughs> yeah. college education very wisely. Um, <laughs> chose my college because the pamphlet looked the nicest. I don't know. That's how I make my choices, I guess. I started off working in communications. I was a communications manager for that Living History Museum that I mentioned. And I got into um, doing social media work for them. I worked for them for about four years, I think from 2017 till about 2021, the beginning of 2021, I want to say we were still pretty in lockdown. I think we were just starting to be able to go back to work again. But once we were able to start going back to work again, <laughs> um, I decided that I never wanted to go back into an office. Um, and so I quit. Um, I was working actually um, on the side. I was working at a cidery, so I was bartending, and I got to doing some social media work with them as well. And I kind of realized, hey, this is something that I can actually do, you know, on the side um, or potentially make into a business. Um, so yeah, after I quit, um, I kept doing the social media work there, but then I also learned about virtual assisting. I learned how to do that. I took a course on that. And then I actually moved back in with my parents for the first time um, while I was trying to build that up a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, it's definitely, I'm sure we're going to get to it, but community is everything. I felt like I was sort of building, trying to build this business a little bit alone. So I got really discouraged and I wound up going back to a, a corporate job. Um, but I thought it was kind of in line with my desire to travel. It was working for um, a really nice boutique hotel in downtown Richmond, Virginia, as an event manager. And I was there for, I don't know, about un under a year. Um, but in that industry, when you first start out, you don't get a lot of PTO, which really bothered me with my love of travel. Um, so I had taken one vacation, but I did not have enough vacation time to um, go on the location indie uh, trip to Africa. So I decided I had enough of that job. Um, and I quit that job and decided to focus on the social media management. And then I started learning the podcast management. So okay. yeah, that's kind of where I am now. I'm doing the podcast management and the, the social media management. And just hearing your stories, I'm sure people are getting a sense and they know this. It's just that these things aren't always so linear. It's not always smooth sailing. And that's that's the point here. I mean, that's why I love these in-depth conversations because people can understand, okay, when I'm struggling, 
with this, that, or the other. I know this is a part of the process. I think it's important to kind of know that that's, that's coming. And yeah, Caitlin, I mean, I was a communications major as well because I got out of the math thing. So, you know, we have that in common. And I was an event manager as well. So there you go. Good vibes. Uh, this is the second theme, by the way. Uh, Janessa, you mentioned pivoting. And you had to make that pivot from in-person jobs to working online. Caitlin, you had to kind of decide to cut the cord on the corporate thing and, and fully commit to the business. And yeah, you know, it's always a, a tricky thing. I mean, you could say pivoting, you could say taking the leap in different ways, depending on how you interpret it. Janessa, for you, how do you know, you mentioned the lifestyle piece, like you didn't want people to dictate your travels, but how, how did you start making the pivot? And I can ask the same question of, of Caitlin as well, like trying to decide, I think that's one of the things that people battle with is like, okay, I want this sort of online digital nomad lifestyle or insert whatever lifestyle you want, but where do you, where do you start? <laughs> Sure, I can go with that one. So like I said, I kind of knew that I was ready for a change. And every time I've made one of these big pivots, I've noticed that my timeline tends to be about six months from getting a new crazy idea to actually doing it. So everyone's timeline is different. Some people need a year, some people do it immediately. But for me, it has maybe from the outside seemed spontaneous, but there definitely is a lot of planning that goes into it. So once I kind of realized that this this yacht job was not necessarily a career for me. I said I could always go back, but I really wanted to give it a shot doing something else. So like I said, I listened to a lot of podcasts. Um, I found a podcast about how to become a podcast manager. So I was listening to that every day. At this point, I was listening to probably over eight hours of podcasts every day about everything, how to do the lifestyle, how to do the travel, visas, setting up a business, taxes, all the logistics that I thought might be useful. I was just consuming all of this content while I was doing other things anyways. And then I also kind of looked at virtual assistant services or maybe travel advising, but podcast was really the thing that I decided I was excited enough to learn a brand new skill. Um, I had no idea if I would be good at it. And I did buy an online course that gave me some resources to kind of get me started with some basic you know, behind the scenes of podcasts and how to start learning how to edit audio. And most people say don't quit your job, um, start it as a side hustle. But unfortunately, it's very hard to start a side hustle while living on a boat. You're literally in a cabin with another person, the Wi Fi is not reliable, your schedule is not your own. So I did not start it as a side hustle. Um, instead, I built up a financial safety net. So if you're going to just quit your job and leap into the unknown, definitely have an amount of money that you're comfortable with. Luckily, living on a boat, there's no living expenses. So I was able to save that within about a year and a half so that I was comfortable that I had about a year of a, a buffer or a safety net to make this work that I figured if I lived frugally on the road, I could live for a lot cheaper than in my home country. And I would be able to keep myself afloat while I built up this business. And so, yeah, I gave myself a year to make it work. And here we are. It's now sustainable to keep up this lifestyle. Nice. Yeah. I mean, if people want to choose their own adventure, depending on their situation, that's a great way to look at it when you're like, okay, why, you know, you explain why you can't do a side hustle. And for other reasons, maybe for somebody listening, a side hustle isn't for them because it's just like their job's too demanding or, it's too stressful, whatever the case is. So the alternative to that, like you said, might be the financial safety net. And then you kind of know, I guess it sounds like you knew, okay, I have like a one year runway to make this work based on what I've saved. And so I'm just going to roll with it and you can roll with it comfortably when you know you have saved the money, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, at the beginning, I wasn't making much at all. I was building up my portfolio I did a little bit of work for free at the beginning. So again, if you feel like you have no skills, just start doing it for somebody that you know. I had been a guest on a podcast and she mentioned something about editing it afterwards. We had been talking about how to get a job on a yacht. And I said, wait a second, do you do all of this yourself? Would you trust me to do some episodes for you in exchange for a testimonial? And so that was my first client. And then from there, I was able to put my portfolio forward and say, Hey, I know a little bit about this stuff now. And 
then just slowly gained experience and gained more clients. And it wasn't like I was quickly able to make an income from it. It definitely was a process and it took a while, but I kept improving my skills and feeling more confident at offering those skills and raising my rates to make it more sustainable for myself. And yeah, here we are about uh, just over a year and a half later. Amazing. Yeah. Congrats. I am going to get both of your advice on, on freelancing and some best practices and things you've learned over, over the last years doing it. But I love that we get two sides of this because uh, Janessa, you had the sort of, what am I going to do? Uh, okay. I need to identify what I want to do. And then I need to acquire a new skill. And then you, like you said, you bought an online course, you invested in yourself, you started networking. And, and so that's like, that's sort of a, a real world example that can overcome an objection to somebody listening at saying, well, I don't have any skills that somebody would pay me for. Well, there's an example of Janessa acquiring a new skill and then offering that as a service. And Caitlin, you on the other side, I mean, like you guys said, you're both coming at this from another angle, uh, from different angles. You you had more of like the transferable skills. You had skills that you were using at a current job that you were able to parlay into your current career. Can you just talk about transferable skills and, and sort of how that played into your journey? Yeah, so... You know, honestly, like at first you, you hear this so many times, like, you know, transferring like your real job experience um, is like the easiest way to get into freelancing. And it really is. And I was in denial because at first I was like, well, I don't know if this is actually what I want to do ultimately. Um, but it is the easiest barrier of entry is to bring like those social media skills into the remote work. So that is what I did. But then I, learn from that is, you know, to make that more enjoyable or to start, I guess, maybe expanding your skill sets. Um, I don't know if this is a real word, but stacking your skills. I don't know if that's like a phrase or not, but I'm going to coin it if it's not. Do um, it. I'm coining it. All right. So that's what I did. I, I stacked my skills. I started with the social media management. Um, and then I took what I was interested in, like I, I niched. And I focused on travel and wellness. At first, I didn't. Um, but once I decided to niche into that, I found it a lot more enjoyable. Um, and then I started building my skills up from there. So that's why I then added in the the, the podcast management. Um, so I think that, you know, really is one of the easiest ways to kind of, you know, break that barrier of entry. And then, and then some insight into that, too. A pivot, like once you pivot once, it doesn't mean like you're stuck in that pivot. I think a lot of people get into that mindset of like, oh, I just left my, you know, corporate job. And now I'm pivoting it into this and now I'm stuck into that. But, you know, you're, you're on your own timeline. You can pivot as many times as you need, you know, until you get to where you ultimately want to be. Love it. And coming at that from both sides, I think is a great way now, now that people are listening and they understand there were, there's two approaches like transferring, stacking skills, as you said, or, you know, acquiring a new skill, either way you come at it, you're going to end up at the same place or in, in a way, which is, you know, running a, a business as a freelancer. And then, so there are some overarching things that all freelancers have to do. You have to, obviously you have to continue to like get better and develop your skill set and everything. But, you know, as important is being able to like, package up and sell your skills and find clients and learn all the things that you need to learn to run a business like that. And so what I'm wanting to hear now is your best advice. So someone's listening and they're like, okay, I'm going to do this thing right now. Like we, I think we're all in a group. This is like one of the easiest ways to go location independent is how I did it first as well. I became a business development consultant. It was like, okay, I'm me. Like I have a laptop. I can... I can do something for people and charge them for it. You don't have to, you know, build a physical product or yeah, you can just offer a service that, that you are able to complete and deliver. I'm sure it was a rocky road, but what you've learned so far, kind of like best practices for people starting out and may, maybe we'll, we can kick it back to Janessa to start off. And then Caitlin, we can come back to you and, and hear some of your uh, thoughts on it. Sure. Yeah. I guess just, Figuring out when you figure out what you want to do, like I said, I listened to a ton of podcasts and I went between a lot of different things before I settled on the podcast management. And there were jobs that I didn't even know that existed. And so listening to what other people have done, and as well, we've mentioned networking and community. I've stayed at a co-living space, 
which is, you know, shared living accommodation with a built in co working. So think more grown up hostel where everybody is working. And everyone said to me, I thought everyone would be doing my job. Like I thought everyone would be in marketing. I thought everyone would be doing coding. I thought everyone would be doing social media. And so there's just so many things. Um, and I've met a lot of people that have done jobs that you wouldn't necessarily expect would be remote or online. And so there just are so many options out there. And like I said, podcasts didn't even exist back when any of us went to school. And that's not what we you know, said we were going to do when we grow up. So it, it might not even exist yet. You know, there's more and more different opportunities with social media constantly changing and with AI. So just keep an open mind and see what is out there and see what catches your attention. And like Caitlin said, it's okay to pivot multiple times if needed. And when developing those skills that, yeah, it's okay to change. I, for a while, fell mostly into the audio editing, which I love, but obviously I'm doing a totally different role with you here on Zero to Travel that I also had no idea a few years ago that I would be able to do. I had no experience in marketing before. And yeah, just figure it out as you go. And when you're getting started, find those first few clients, someone that is willing to pay you, or maybe even at the beginning, like I said, do a little bit for free. Not too much though. Um, but just to build up your portfolio and to show that you know what you're doing. And you don't need to have it all figured out right away. You don't need to go fully branding your business. Uh, we were talking about websites just before we hit record. You don't have to have a website right away. Um, if you can just connect with a few people online or maybe through word of mouth or like Caitlin did, working for an employer doing something else, that there's lots of ways to kind of get your foot in the door and you don't have to have it all figured out before you start. Caitlin, yeah, you don't have a website right now. We were talking about this before we were recorded. And I think that's, again, you guys coming at it from both sides, right? I think there can be a tendency for some people to focus on the things that aren't necessarily driving the business forward. Like that doesn't mean if you have a website, you're doing that. But you could sit behind and you could spend eight months building a website, but you know, invest no time getting clients when that's how you're going to actually get paid. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a lot of ways to, to do it. Caitlin, what were some of the challenges for you early on? Like, was it selling or packaging? Like, what and what were some of the things you did to that have made the biggest difference in your freelance business? Yeah. Um, well, to add to the whole website thing, um, that was one of my challenges when I first got started with like the virtual assisting. So, like my first go around um, with you know working for myself, I got way too caught up in those types of details, building the website, like you know, making sure my branding is perfect and everything visually looks nice and stuff. And in hindsight, I realized that was really me. Um, I was kind of scared to, I think, really go in on everything. So those, you know, I have to have all this stuff ready in order for me to start, you know, so that was like kind of my excuse to not fully get started. So I've learned like not to let those little details hold you back. I found the right clients for me they don't need me to have the perfect website. That's not, you know, that's not really what matters. Um, what I found that has made the the biggest difference for me is having community. Um, I had mentioned earlier, you know, when I first started doing the virtual assistance, I was doing it by myself. You know, I, I had taken a course, which I think is an excellent idea to do. Um, I took a course both for virtual assisting and for the podcast management. Um, Janessa and I are both in the same podcast um, course community. Yeah, surrounding yourself with people who are doing similar things um, or either the same exact role or they're just, you know, digital nomads or they're working remote. Um, they love to travel, getting involved in those communities and surrounding yourself with people who are going to support you. I think is so key because I mean, even still, I have friends that they support what I do, but they don't get it. And it's kind of discouraging when you try to talk about those things. So um, it gets kind of frustrating, makes you kind of like second guess yourself. So being around those right people, I think makes, you know, uh, an absolute world of difference. Um, and then, yeah, one other thing um, that came to mind that really, I think, hindered me up until recently, actually, is getting stuck as a freelancer, um, getting stuck in that employer mindset trap. 
and forgetting like, no, you are a, a freelancer. You're a business owner. You need to create those boundaries um, with your clients um, and set those expectations and all of that. And yeah, just, you know, get out of that, get out of that employer trap. <laughs> what is the best way to create those boundaries with clients when you're working as a freelancer? Well, um, you know, what I found is set them from the beginning. You know, once you start answering those emails at nine o'clock at night, um, once you start getting back to them, you know, right away, which getting back to people is fantastic. You should get back to people as soon as you can. But, you know, it, it starts setting those expectations kind of subconsciously in your client. Um, and it's sort of hard to start backtracking those once it gets too far. Cool. Janessa, you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I also really struggled with boundaries. I still do, but I found it very difficult at the beginning is I would say yes to anything. I would take on clients even if they weren't the best fit just because I wanted experience, which is okay. Um, but I'm much happier with a lot of the clients I'm working with now. And yeah, not always being constantly available. You guys know I just came back from a vacation and that was the first time I've taken a week fully disconnected. Um, I've said in the past that I am going on holidays. I've tried to get all the materials from my clients ahead of time so that everything keeps running as it should. But I was still answering emails when I was, you know, at Christmas markets with my mom and I was still uh, uploading things at the last minute that they didn't get to me on time. And this time I was very firm in that I am going to be off grid for a whole week and yes. <laughs> the world didn't end. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's important. I know it sounds like, yeah, for some people listening, it might sound like, well, sure. Yeah, you get your vacation. But, you know, like you said, you have to you have to kind of set yourself up for that when you're running your own business because there are still things that need to be done when you're gone. It's a tricky balance. By the way, you mentioned, you guys have both mentioned community throughout uh, this episode, and that was the third big theme I had pulled out from what you sent over just to tie that up. And like, you can get that from online communities, from, like you said, courses that are run as cohorts where you're kind of in a community together and referring each other and helping each other out. Co-living, if you want to do it in person, you mentioned Janessa, that, that sort of thing. And Janessa, I mean, you've been heavily involved in the digital nomad community in, in person in various areas. And I know Caitlin, you're going to a, a digital nomad conference coming up here. What have the in-person connections done for you both? I guess we'll start with you, Caitlin. Uh, what what haven't they done? I'm I'm going to uh, Bansko next month. Um, I'm going to Camp Indy. I got a lot of conferences going on. Um, they've, I mean, they just give you, I think that that confidence when you attend those um, that you don't get. I mean, virtual groups are great, but there's just something about the energy um, that builds when you're in the moment and you're with just people who who get it and who want to support you like fully. And two, I think those in-person events um, and conferences and things like that are great for networking. Um, I know we've talked about me not having a website. I haven't had to have a website because I'm involved in these communities and I'm going to these events and I'm networking with these people, uh, which has been just a game changer. Nice. Janessa. Yeah, same thing. So Caitlin, I'm so excited for you that you're going to attend Bunsko Nomad Fest this year. Unfortunately, I won't make it this year, but I had an amazing time there last year, made a lot of really great connections and stuck around the town of Bunsko, Bulgaria for three months in the summer and really just got to know people on a deeper level. I have not attended Camp Indy yet, unfortunately, but like you said, Jason, I've stayed at a lot of co-livings. I've actually just returned to my favorite one in Mexico. So it's so nice just being around other people that are doing what you're doing, even if maybe they're not freelancing, maybe they're not in the same field or industry, but you know, everyone's working during the day and then evenings and weekends is free game for us to hang out. And I also really love going to cities that are nomad hotspots. So for example, I was just in Buenos Aires for a few months in Argentina, and it just happened to be the place to be earlier this year where I was meeting up with friends that I met in Bonsco last year and other friends that I met in Mexico and they didn't all necessarily know each other, but it just happened to be everybody coming together at the same place. So it makes this life a lot more sustainable when you're not alone. You don't feel lonely in it because you know 
often when you travel, you meet people and you know you're saying goodbye. But I've shown myself enough times over and over that if I want, it, it's not goodbye, that I'm going to run into these same people in other parts of the world. So I have friends that I've met up with in two, three, four different cities already. And so I know that anywhere I go, I can find community. And I love joining, you know, nomad or expat WhatsApp groups for all kinds of different special interests. When I arrive in places, I've started learning dancing, like salsa and bachata. And that's one thing that if I show up in a city, I can just jump right into that community, even if I don't know the local language that, you know, I'm not a particularly good dancer, but it's just an activity that you have in common with people. And then you meet people. And so, you know, I've danced bachata with people in Bonsco and Buenos Aires. So it's, it's just made all the difference, um, both for business, like Caitlin said, as well, meeting people that you can collaborate or do partnerships with or refer clients to each other. But also just it makes the lifestyle sustainable. Because like I said, you're, you're not alone, you're not lonely. And you've always got people that that understand it. And you speak the international language of dance, which helps, <laughs> you know, of course. Um, speaking of being alone, Caitlin, you're about to take your first proper solo adventure. How are you feeling? I am. I am super excited, but I am starting to get incredibly nervous at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be okay. I mean... As you heard from Janessa, it's, it's, it seems like it's so easy to get plugged into these communities now. It sounds like you're going to uh, the right places. You know, I, I do want to talk about travel because you mentioned Buenos Aires and you're, you're going to Bulgaria coming up here, Caitlin. So we're going to, I want to hear a little bit about some of your favorite destinations. But I did have one more business question and that was around selling because I think that's one of the things that people struggle with quite a bit in the beginning is selling themselves or maybe having the confidence to sell themselves or just, you know, having, having, figuring out how to value things and what they're offering. I know this can get very specific depending on each person's situation, but there are also some, some core themes that go along with that and like having the confidence to sell, for example. What have you learned selling your services, like some of the best practices or just insights or you know, practical tips, really looking for anything here around actually selling your services and bringing home the bacon. Caitlin, you can kick this off if you'd like. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think the two biggest things that I've learned about selling is one, don't try to be like everyone else. That's just going to stress you out, you know, trying to fit into that cookie cutter. You know, I would go on social media and see what all the other, you know, virtual assistants or social media people were posting. And I would try to recreate these really generic social media posts to try to attract these clients. Um, and it didn't work at all. I would just post these very generic things. And what I realized is being yourself is what sells you and showing your full personality, because that's how you're going to attract people like who you enjoy working with and who genuinely want to work with you. I think that's how you get good quality clients. Um, and then the other thing that kind of goes along with that and about marketing yourself and social media and all of that is just have fun with it. If you're not having fun with your business, chances are it's not going to you know, be something that you stick with for the long haul. Um, I think those are the two biggest things that really kind of changed my entire perspective on, on my freelancing for sure. Janessa, anything to add? Yeah. I also really hated selling myself at first. I found it very difficult to put myself out there. Um, I'm the opposite of Caitlin. I actually do not like being on social media. So I found it very hard to show up there and tell people what I was doing. So the first few uh, opportunities were a little bit of a grind, but at this point, it's mostly through word of mouth and referrals that I do get my clients. And then just knowing the value of what I do provide to my clients and kind of attracting a certain type that will value the services at the rates that I've said. So, I mean, most of my clients that I work with, you're a bit of an exception, Jason, because of the scale that Zero to Travel is already at. But majority of people starting out a podcast, it should be as marketing for their own business rather than 
a moneymaker in itself. So they know that they're paying me from their marketing budget and that I'm, you know, giving them their time back and I'm getting their podcast into the world and I'm getting it produced every week. And that in the long run, that this is, you know, bringing in traffic for their business. They're selling their own services or coaching or products. And so they see the value in hiring someone to just take it off their plate and do a good job in it. And at this point, I've gained the confidence that I am, you know, good at what I do. And I um, can bring a lot of value to their businesses. So those are the kind of clients that I work with primarily, um, because it can be a much tougher sell if You know, I love that people just start a podcast because they want to, but everybody wants to start one these days. And if they're, if they don't have a clear intention behind it, it's very hard for them to justify paying people like us what it's worth. Absolutely. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Well, Caitlin, going back to what you said about just being yourself and I mean, you can hear listening to this podcast, whoever's listening, when you're listening to this right now and understanding, okay, yeah, to me, you guys, you know, traveling around doing this and that and, and being nomadic and all this is, is a selling point. I'm like, yeah, bring them on. This is, this is like the exact type of people who I want here. You know, you know, I think it's easy to kind of fall into the trap of like, oh, I don't know if people will hire me if they think if they, you know, know I'm working from Cambodia for three months or whatever the case is, when in actuality, if you have the right match, they'll, they should be excited about that and, and happy for you. Yeah. Janessa, what you were just saying, the, the basically kind of educating your prospective clients on the fact that, Hey, look, this is like, this is the value you're getting from this. Like that does make selling much easier, right? When you're able to demonstrate what they're getting in return and, and they start to see that the value in that, then it becomes much easier to kind of sell because you're really just selling the value of what you're offering. You're not necessarily having to sell yourself, right? It's all the stuff that comes with that and what they're going to get back in return. On that note, one more sort of business related thing, advice for business owners you work with. Like here, here I am sort of travel. Okay. Uh, I wanted to bring you on and I have like certain ways I do that and things that I like to do with people that I'm working with. And I feel like I want, I want you all to feel like you're really a core part of this thing. Cause you are, and, and that it's, you know, you're part of bringing this mission uh, forward every week on the podcast and I want to keep you both happy. <laughs> so this is like, I uh, maybe a little bit of this question is like, what can I do better? But for uh, advice for business owners out there that are, um, would be working with freelancers, like how can they get you started in the best way possible and set you up for success? Um, I can start again. Um, you know, I think one thing that some clients don't realize is that the success of the work that Janessa and I do or any other freelancer or contractor does is also dependent on their cooperation and their communication and them providing the materials and such that we need to do our job and especially to do it in a timely manner and to be able to meet their expectations. Um, I've definitely worked with clients, not you, Jason, um, <laughs> who have these very high expectations um, or these very short deadlines and turnaround times that don't allow me to provide the quality work that that they're expecting and that I want to provide. Um, and that kind of makes the situation a little bit difficult. Um, and then I think it's also important, you know, for clients to remember that not every podcast manager, not every virtual assistant, social media manager is going to come to you with the same skill set, we're all going to have different life experiences, different, you know, add ons, like I do social media and podcast management, you know, we're all going to come with different, different things that we're good at different things that we may, you know, need a little bit more support in and things like that. Um, And then two for the clients to remember that we are business owners ourselves. um, And, you know, we might not be available in that nine to five, um, kind of time frame, you know, Um, We're going to work on our own time, but we're going to make sure that we provide the work that the quality work that, you know, you expect. Cool. Janessa? Absolutely. I totally agree with what Caitlin just said. Um, Really going back to establishing those boundaries at the beginning and the communication and just being really clear with your clients of 
what is included and what is not included, what the best ways of communication are, um, how you each want to communicate with each other, and just so that that's really established from the start and making sure that it's a good fit. Uh, like she said, we're not employees, so you can't expect us to be working nine to five or at your beck and call like an employee. And Jason, you love that we're off traveling the world, but then it maybe isn't the best fit for somebody that wants someone you know in a certain time zone or has a little bit more of a regular stable lifestyle. But in our case, it's you know finding the clients that do value that. And like Caitlin said, with you know, quick turnaround times and expectations. Again, it's really important to be clear on those expectations. I do a lot of audio editing and I'm definitely a perfectionist about it and I go very detailed. So if clients want something just quick and simple and cheap, then I'm not the audio editor for them. Whereas if they really want a high quality finished product, even if it takes a little bit longer, then that would be a better fit for both of us. On the lifestyle side, Janessa, maybe you can give us a little bit of a sense of because you've been doing the nomad thing for a while now and you're doing it as a freelancer. And I'm just wondering, yeah, what could people, again, everybody has a variety of scenarios, but let's say, you know, you're traveling on your own for the solo traveler that's out, going to live this lifestyle, travel around, go to nomad hotspots, kind of like not replicate what you're doing, but kind of like the same vibe of your style travel, right? Like setting up in these, some of these hotspots, traveling around, taking breaks in between. What, what would, What's kind of been working for you? What what do they expect? What should one expect to to spend roughly? I'm just curious, like if you can just give paint the picture of, uh, yeah, the, like the day to day lifestyle, the the cost, how you manage that. Just curious. Sure, I love being transparent about this. I come at it from a little bit of a different angle in that, like I said, I had been traveling for quite a long time first, and then had to figure out how to work well on the road to keep myself traveling. Whereas there are a lot of people that now are suddenly able to work remote. And so they know how to work from home, but they need to figure out the traveling piece. So I was kind of the opposite in that sense. Um, a lot of people, if they do come from countries like the US or Canada, if they're bringing that salary with them, they'll have a much easier time living in other countries. Nearly everywhere is a lot cheaper. So I mostly stuck to more affordable countries when I started out, mostly Latin America. Eastern Europe. I have not yet been to Asia, but that's another popular way to start. So I typically spend probably between $1,500 and $2,000 a month for my entire lifestyle. So my friends back home that say, I don't know how you can afford to travel, what they pay for their mortgage and car payment, because I don't have any of those, um, what they spend on that, I spend on absolutely everything. So definitely the way to make it more sustainable, both energy wise and financially is really just to slow down. At the beginning, I was staying more like one month in a place and people that are used to backpacking, that seems like forever. But when you are working full time and you're, you really want to get immersed in a place, I feel like that's the, the bare minimum for me personally. And now I've slowed down to even more like two months to three months at a time, even and like I said, with the cost of if people are used to paying that amount in rent, for me, more expensive cities are a bit of a shock because like I said, I had no living expenses working on a boat. So I kind of came back into a pre or sorry, post pandemic world of going, wait, that's that's what rent costs in places. So for me, staying on the road is actually the more affordable, more sustainable option since I can't I can't even fathom spending the amount on rent that a lot of people do or mortgage or whatever they have and just the the lifestyle that comes with, you know, living in a country. I also haven't owned a, owned a car in five years. So that's a lot of money I've saved right there as well. Most other places in the world have very good public transportation. I love walkable cities. I love riding a bike. And so all of those kind of trade-offs, you know, you trade the stability of having your own home and vehicle just can translate to, you know, a much better experience in a lot of other places. So I guess my key advice from that is just slow down. Um, that'll make it more sustainable in the long run. Love that. And I was just talking to somebody the other day, and you know, I live in Norway, which is notoriously expensive. And they're like, do you think you'd ever go back to the U.S.? I'm like, I can't afford to go back to the U.S. right now. <laughs> and so, yeah. You know, I'm sure there's people listening to what you just said, and you, you painted that picture so well. And they're like, hmm, like getting to the point where you're actually 
not even hard to get to the point where, where you're actually like, this is way cheaper than what my situation now. I'm sure you just parked up some ears there. So yeah, thanks for being transparent about that. A couple of things before I let you go, Caitlin, on the travel side, can you share like maybe an experience or a trip you've taken that this transition you've made to to freelancing and be able to work location independently has allowed you to have that you really treasure or uh, or perhaps maybe it's just something that you have coming up that you're really looking forward to. I actually recently just went with LI to uh, to Potsland, Mexico for a retreat, um, kind of like a for like a breath work and healing retreat. And, you know, if if I didn't work remote and, you know, I moved back in with my parents to afford this lifestyle so that I can take off um, and travel the world in a couple months. Um, but I wouldn't be able to do these things. So yeah, that experience was absolutely incredible. It was about two weeks. I was in Mexico City. And then we went to, to Potsdam, Mexico, which is considered a magic town, um, which describes the area so perfectly. We went to up in the mountains. Um, we got to have a, um, Tamez cow, which is like a sweat lodge ceremony with, um, like the chief of the town. And it was just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And once again, it's that community piece being around people who are also, you know, have the same goals and, you know, want the same, want the same things to be surrounded by those people in those mountains. It was just an absolutely beautiful experience. And yeah, I wouldn't have gotten to have that if I didn't, you know, take the risk and quit my job. <laughs> and now you're going on your solo epic. I don't know when I'm coming home journey. Yes, which is I am. Also exciting. I have a one, one way ticket and uh, we'll see how long I last. <laughs> yes. We love to hear about one way tickets here. All right, Janessa, I mean, you were just in Argentina, one of my favorite places that I haven't been to in so long. Can you just share a little bit about your time there and what it was like and what you got to do? I mean, you just came back from holiday, so I, I don't really know the specifics. How was the experience there? Yeah, Argentina was amazing. Like I said, it was a bit of a hot spot, especially kind of the first quarter of this year. It just happened to be where a lot of nomads ended up. So the community was amazing. There were events going on every single day. Um, in some ways, it was a little bit challenging because it is such a large city and the co-living culture hasn't really taken off there yet. So everybody tends to get their own apartment. Whereas in a hub like Bansko, you're within a 10 minute walk of all of your friends. Buenos Aires is a huge city. It's very spread out, but I do like cities and I just love the culture there. The people are so nice. The food is great. And I joined a co-working space there. So I wasn't just working from home from my apartment all day by myself. And while I was there, I, like I said, did a lot of dancing and meeting up with people and did a small trip to Bariloche. Um, Patagonia. And I know that I need to go back and see more of Patagonia. And that experience was incredible. Just being in the lake region, going hiking with friends that, again, I had met in other parts of the world previously. And so we rented a house together and just hung out for a week and had really quality time. And I also did a weekend trip to Iguazu Falls. And so that was super accessible from, from Buenos Aires. And I really just kind of existed there for a few months, which was nice to not be on the move constantly. I ended up staying about three months. And then like you mentioned, my vacation, I was actually just in Guatemala. So unfortunately, I didn't explore more of South America this time. That isn't quite what I fit in. And so then I flew back up, you know, halfway across the the continents uh, to Guatemala and now Mexico, um, since I am actually going to go home to Canada for the summer this year, something that I have not done in about seven years and I'm really, really looking forward to. Wow. Yeah. A Canadian summer sounds like a lovely way to spend the summer. I mean, are there any other um, destinations that you want to give a shout out to, let's say, for people that are embarking on, say, their first, um, let's say someone listening and is, is buying a one-way ticket in the future? Yeah, I was, what should they I was smiling as Caitlin was describing Mexico because, <laughs> you know, even though it is our neighbor and a lot of people go there to resorts and stuff. It's just the whole country is so beautiful. And to just be able to explore different cities, towns, landscapes, I will never get tired of Mexico. As I said, I'm back and I'm in San Cristobal in the south. So it's in the mountains. I also 
absolutely love Oaxaca City, just the culture, the food, the markets, the colors. It's one of my favorite spots. So Mexico is one that I'll probably always go back to because there's always more to explore. And then in Europe, Berlin just has a special place in my heart because that is where I moved when I first started this adult gap year that never ended. And I lived there for two years. And again, it's just such a fun city. There's always things going on. And I just have a lot of good friends there. So I keep going back at least once or twice a year to visit. And at the time, it was a very good hub for seeing the rest of Europe. When I was working a location dependent job, I every month was able to take off to a different country. As you know, Europe is super accessible by trains and buses and budget airlines. And I'll never get tired of exploring different corners of Europe. And the gap year continues <laughs> well beyond a year. No, that's awesome. Thank you for that. And before I let you both go, first of all, I would love for you to share where people can connect. Of course, we'll link up to all this stuff. Um, but if they have more questions for you, or just want to say thanks for all the value you've given today or whatever, you can just, yeah, feel free to let people know where to do that. Caitlin, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so the best place to reach me is probably my Instagram, which is at this is Caitlin Sun. Um, or you can send me an email and that's hello at caitlinson.co. And for me, my Instagram is just my name, Janessa Klatt. And my website is janessaclatt.com. Um, my website also, like Caitlin, I kind of hesitate on it for a while since, like I said, it's mostly word of mouth clients. So I make podcasts, not websites, <laughs> but that is out in the world now. You know, we love a good quote here. Both of you know that. Do you want to share something that's sticking to you? Maybe it's not a quote. Maybe it's just like a, a little phrase or something you're living by right now. Some words of wisdom, perhaps. Anything. I'll leave it open. Caitlin? Yeah. So actually, I am in the middle of reading. It's called The Pivot Year by um, Brianna Weist. And it's every day. It is just a different um, quote. It's 365 days to become the best person you truly want to be. Um, so I read mine today. I read mine every morning and this is a short one. It says, you don't need a life without a fight. You need a life worth fighting for. Love that. Janessa. Yeah, this was my favorite one back in my athlete days. So it was by the, uh, American distance runner, Steve Prefontaine. And he said to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. So we all have gifts to give this world and, yeah, we should share them with people. Do you hear how awesome these two are? <laughs> you, the listener, how lucky am I? Sincerely, thank you both so much for taking the time to do this and for all of the, the work you do behind the scenes on the pod. Uh, it is uh, so appreciated. You're both so appreciated. And, you know, if I'm one of those clients, you need to get in line, just, you know, kick my butt. Go ahead and do it. I mean, you, you could do it now. I mean, if, if you want or, uh -oh. you know. You, <laughs> Hop on a call afterwards, but uh, <laughs> sincerely appreciate everything that you both do here. And I'm, I'm glad that we got uh, to give people the opportunity to learn from uh, your wisdom that you've earned over the uh, last years running your businesses. And also just to give people an idea of like, you know, who else contributes to this show and, and who makes it a reality each and every week. Uh, so we can continue to you know help people travel the world, which is what this is all about. So thank you both so very much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. There you have it. I mean, how lucky am I? How lucky am I to work with these two wonderful people? Thank you so much to them. Once again, I just want to say that. Thanks for all the work they do. Hopefully they're listening to this. And... Yeah, we'll have to get our last member on the podcast at some point, Chris. He's been my editor for over a decade now, which is crazy. He's going to be next on the on the team hit list. So, Chris, if you're listening to this, I'm guessing you are since you're editing it. Watch out, buddy. We're coming for you. All right. Um, <laughs> before I let you go, uh, just some thoughts on the interview. I think that it's super inspiring to hear how people make the transition in in an honest way, right? Like it's so easy to kind of just Google around or search online and see these sort of bullet point lists, like 10 ways to, to freelance in 
the coming year or, you know, 25 best tactics or the blueprint for starting an online business or becoming a nomad and all this stuff. And it's just like, all right, yeah, we might use some of that stuff. You might not. But here we get a chance to just really hear in depth what a journey like this looks like. And it's more than just a blueprint or a hit list. It's a process. It's a process you have to go through that allows you to to grow and to to fail and learn from your mistakes and have some successes and hopefully ultimately get to live the lifestyle you want to live. And I hope this inspired you, uh, some of you out there listening, whether you're planning on doing something like this uh, in the future, the near future, or perhaps not right now, but maybe far off you might uh, might consider it. I hope this show was helpful for you. And don't be afraid to sell yourself. A lot of times our ability to sell a service or to package something up is really tied closely with our self-worth. And if you're having a hard time feeling worthy, then you'll probably have a hard time selling. And as we discussed a bit in the chat, the way to get yourself off of that is to focus on the person you are serving, right? It kind of takes the pressure off of you. And if you have something that's really going to help them, you don't even have to think about the selling or feel bad about it. Some people feel bad about selling and collecting money, but look, you're providing a service. Don't feel bad about it. If they're happily paying and you're helping them out, you're you can all feel good about it. But just know from a sort of a mindset perspective, it's I think it's good to be aware of the fact that if you're struggling with the idea of uh, selling yourself in some way, then just kind of check in and, and maybe ask why. Why is that? And is there a deep weed or root you need to pull out of your mindset to kind of reframe that? Just something to think about as we send you off on your day. Right now with a quote from the quote drawer, random one I'm pulling out here. Who knows what I'm going to get? Okay, here it is. Sir uh, Sri Chimoy. I butcher these names like crazy. Okay, here's the quote. We accept the world in order to change it. If you do not accept, then what are you going to change? Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. Peace and love to you and yours. Cheers. This podcast has been brought to you by ZeroToTravel.com. Ideas and advice to make your travel dreams a reality. 